And again, a nice deep breath. <sighs> Relaxing even more as you breathe in the intelligence, the wisdom, the essence of the divine presence. Prana, chi. Letting it awaken the wisdom in the cells as it feeds the blood, the bones, the tissues, the organs. Harmonizing and balancing all the systems of the body, the metabolism, the immune system, the nervous system, the circulatory system. the chemical factory of the brain, the greatest pharmacy in the universe, releasing the exact right balance of hormones and chemicals to bring about peace and wholeness and healing. Reducing inflammation Soothing the emotions, letting the mind clear as the heart is open and receptive. And every exhale is a gentle releasing of old energy and disease and toxins and waste. The DNA in perfect balance, in alignment with source, not at the effect of your family history, not at the effect of anything except the divine pattern of perfect, radiant health, vitality, longevity, all with no effort at all from you. Your part is simply to soften and allow, to forgive the body for any judgments you have had against it. If there is anything in the body you have judged or resisted, just breathe in forgiveness and acceptance, letting it be just the way it is and just the way it is not. As you begin now to let go of anything you brought in here with you this morning that no longer serves you whether it is some old limiting belief, a grievance about the past, some unforgiveness to yourself or others, a worry about the present or future, feelings of shame or blame or attack or separation. Did you come here this morning to surrender to spirit? We're gonna let it all go with the exhale, so take a nice deep breath and breathe it all out. Releasing it to that stream of light as it dissolves and dissipates into nothing. Letting yourself float freely now. Rising up in consciousness above the body and the story of this life just for now. Letting go of separation and differences 
rising into the secret place of the Most High, into oneness with Source, with Divine Mind, the Christ Consciousness, the Buddha Heart, the arms of the Divine Mother. Just for now, letting go of all wants and needs and desires, and finally letting go of thoughts and words to tabernacle in the silence with the one presence. oneness, you can begin to choose to make choices, beginning first with how you want to feel. Let go of all hope and wishing and decide, choose. How do you want to feel when you leave here today? do you want to feel the rest of this weekend and in the coming week? What is the energy that you want to bring to your life this week? and appreciation and breathing out praise and thanksgiving feeling grateful now for all the good in your world what are you thankful for this morning what are the blessings in your life What is it that brings you joy? What makes your heart sing? And we give thanks for our collective blessings, the chair we sit in, the beings around us, vision, the staff, the volunteers, this beautiful space to gather in, these sacred teachings that we study, the freedom that we have in this country to gather like this and believe or not believe whatever we choose, the paved roads that got us here, water to bathe in and drink, abundant food, so much good, we stop this morning to appreciate, and now
now call to mind at least three things that you can honor and appreciate about yourself. Three things that are wonderful about you. You can even stretch your consciousness to be grateful for future blessings. That which is still in the invisible, but even now moving towards manifestation. As we now move into our prayerful intentions, what we open to receive from the bounty within, not to get from some mythical presence outside of us, but to receive from the divine presence within. What are your prayerful intentions? And you might go even deeper to see what is your soul's deepest intention in being here this morning? Hold all of these into our group intention, which is, as always, the healing of our minds, a restoration to joy, to sanity, to inner peace. We recognize that we have been drawn together this morning by the power and in the presence of God. And it is to God that we devote our time spent together, as well as our relationships to one another knowing that the Holy Spirit within us will so guide us in our thoughts and in our feelings and in our perceptions of all things that we may go to sleep tonight as happier, more peaceful, and more loving beings. For this we are thankful, and together we all say, Amen. Oh. Welcome. Wonderful to see you. Thanks for coming out. I love coming here, wherever I am. <laughs> I won't say, because I say it wrong every time. When I'm in Santa Barbara, I say that I'm in San Diego. And when I'm in San Diego, I say that I'm in Santa Barbara. So really, I don't know where the hell I am half the time. I'm just always happy to be there. <laughs> That's my motto, It's just be happy to be there. All right. Um, let me just read something here from this amazing book, Affirmations 101. <laughs> this may be the best book ever written. I don't know. It's day 74, which means we are in Affirmation 74. I am in the divine flow of life. So it starts, every, each one of them starts with a quote. So this is, quote is from Neville Goddard. Magnetism is not generated it is displayed. Health, wealth, beauty, and genius are not created. They are only manifested by the arrangement of your mind, that is, by your concept of yourself. The importance of this in your daily life should be immediately apparent. The basic nature of the primal cause is consciousness. Therefore, the ultimate substance of all things is consciousness. Neville Goddard. We are either aligned with the divine flow of life or we are resisting it. Just stop right there. <laughs> it's very important that we get that one sentence because it really describes what is the foundation of new thought, which is that there is only one power. Now, this is something that Joel Goldsmith makes a huge deal out of, recognizing there are not two powers. There's just one power. So when you, if you come to religious science and you take classes on prayer treatment, then a lot of times what you will hear in the beginning of prayer treatment is there is only God. There's only one God. God is all there is, and all there is is God. So that doesn't leave room for anything else. Um, a Course in Miracles starts very much the same way in the introduction, where it says there's just love. It seems like there's love and fear, but there's really just love. 
says, you know, what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. So God is all there is, and all there is is God. The way Abraham says it, Abraham says there's just a stream of well-being. There's not a stream of well-being and a stream of sickness. So we're either in the flow or we're resisting the flow. That's all that's ever happening. So we're not caught up in some negative stream. You know, sometimes you think that. We're not caught up in some negative stream. We're just unconsciously resisting the stream of well-being the stream of wholeness, the stream of love, the stream of peace, the stream of all of that is being resisted in some way. So that's good to know right there, right? So if you're resisting, what do you do? Relax. Relax. <laughs> Relax. This is very hard for Americans. <laughs> we are really not comfortable with the idea of relaxing. No one ever got an award for relaxing. There'll be no statues for the great relaxers. <laughs> so that's hard. We like, we like to think about forcing, making it happen, working harder, all of that. So everything that I'm going to talk about today will go contrary to that part of the mind that wants to earn it. When we started out with Neville talking about consciousness, everything is consciousness. So there's... That's why life seems unfair, but isn't unfair. Because we're taught in this culture, I can't speak about other cultures because I've only ever been here in America. But here, we're taught that you earn everything, even though there's no evidence of that anywhere. Right? There's no evidence of that, that you earn anything. Is there? When you look, just look at our culture, and you can see that most of the time, the people who are working the hardest are living in poverty. Right? A lot of assholes have people who love them. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> so that should show you can't earn love or relationships. So it has to be something else. Well, what it is is consciousness. It is consciousness. We can look right now, certainly, this will be a lot going on for the next year in this country. <laughs> but Donald Trump is where he is because of consciousness. No matter what you think of him, he is where he is because he believes he should be there. Right? So the universe is actually extremely fair, but not in the way that we thought of it as being fair. It's fair in the sense that you get whatever you're able to accept. Whatever you expect and accept is really what you have. So our life is a reflection of our consciousness. And you don't have a blanket consciousness. We have consciousness in this area and in this area and this. So you have a money consciousness, you have a health consciousness, you have a wealth consciousness, you have a work consciousness. You so you might have one area of your life that just runs very, very smoothly because in that area you believe that's how it should be. And another area that just seems like endless struggle because unknown to you, you believe that's how that should be. Maybe you wish it wasn't that way. Maybe you think it's not fair that it's that way, but that is somehow reflective of some belief that you have. So that's why Ernest Holmes over and over and over again would talk about when he's talking about the prayer treatment, that the treatment never leaves the mind of the practitioner. So treatment, prayer treatment, this is why really Joel Goldsmith always makes a big deal about how prayer has never worked in the history of mankind in the way that people think of prayer working. Because people think of prayer as your sales pitch to Santa God. <laughs> <laughs> and there ain't no such thing, and it doesn't work. But that what prayer really is is the person convincing their own mind. So prayer does work, but it doesn't do anything to something out there. It does something to the inner being. And then the inner being can see sometimes change out here reflected based on that consciousness. So all we're ever doing is working on our consciousness. And that's really the real work. But again, it seems counterproductive in a sense that the work is mostly to relax. 
That's the main work. Is can, how great can you let it get? It's very different than what we're taught. Is how good can you make your life be? Can you force it into being? You know, Barbara DeAngelis used to, for those of you who are old timers that remember, Barbara DeAngelis used to teach making love work, and my friend Zan always would call it forcing love to work. <laughs> it was kind of like that too, if you do any of this stuff. It's like forcing love to work. And, uh, and you, she wrote a book, and I like Barbara DeAngelis, but she's part of that whole sort of struggle your way in. I don't know that she's like that anymore, but I remember years ago she wrote a book called The One that was about basically all that she had learned from her 18 marriages. <laughs> this right there should tell you, the relationship expert in her you know, 100th marriage. And it was like a book this big of The One, how you find The One. And it was mostly about eliminating people. You know, because like anybody who has children who are toxic and anybody who did this and anybody, I'm like, who the hell's left? There's nobody left <laughs> in the world. Because even if you found that one person who made it through, jumped through all those hoops, then you have to really be honest is what do they want with you? Right. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> not that you're so terrible, but really, I mean, the perfect person might not be looking for you with the shit you got going on. <laughs> Right? <laughs> okay. We're either aligned with the divine flow of life or we are resisting it. When we are focused on fear, negation, lack, and general negativity, we are denying and resisting the divine flow and are magnetizing all that is alignment with that lack and negation. The answer to this is quite simple. Relax and go with the flow. It is not necessary for us to concentrate on what we want to magnetize into our lives. The law of attraction works without force or effort. We do not force gravity to work. Natural laws don't need our help to work. Of course, relaxing goes against most everything that we've been taught about creating a good life. Yet the truth is that as we let our minds relax, we are able to get into the positive flow of life and we are often effortlessly carried downstream to where there is more and more good already manifesting before us. Our real work is the orderly arrangement of positive thoughts and attitudes for consciousness to use as the source of our magnetism. So, and then I always end with a little treatment. As I gently relax into the divine flow of life today, I am attracting all the best of everything into my world. You may go. <laughs> Just think about that all month. I'll see you in September. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I watched a couple of documentaries uh, in the last month. One of them was a documentary of Greg Louganis that was on HBO, and one was a documentary about the comedian Chris Farley. And it was so fascinating. I, it's hot. I don't enjoy things in the way that most normal people do because I'm always picking things apart based on my work <laughs> and sort of looking behind the screen of everything. And, but it was so, both of them were just such a perfect example of how consciousness operates. And in particular, how, uh, you know, that whole idea of, one of the things that I have learned, listen, all the goals that I have now in life are material goals. They are all material goals. Now, this is, this is kind of the opposite of most people's journey in all of this stuff. Because what I have found now at this point in my life is how to be happy all the time, no matter what. Now, what most people's journey about in New Thought is they come to New Thought with the idea of material. Right? I want to get the maid, I want to get my health in order, I want to get the right job, I want to do all of these things. Part of my big impetus was that, but it was really under the guise of, and then I'll be happy, and then I'll be okay. Because this is really what the mind tells us. If everything would work out the way I wanted it to, then I would be okay. And this is certainly the same kind of story with somebody like Chris Farley and Greg Louganis. The idea of getting everything out there to be a certain way, and then I will feel the way I want to feel. Well, luckily for me, nothing worked for me for a long, 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 long time. In fact, one of the, you know, my journey has been very strange. Like, 
maybe a lot of your journeys have been weird where you've zigzagged around a lot of stuff. I've not had many straight lines in my life. I've been very mostly sort of circling around things. And so I came to New Thought through Terry Cole Whitaker back in 1984, I guess, or somewhere around there, 83 or 84, when I was living here in San Diego. And she was known then as the High Priestess of Prosperity, right? Even though that was really just a small part of what she talked about, it's interesting because once you get tagged to something, that's kind of it. One of my favorite teachers is Catherine Ponder, who uh, wrote the book the dynamic laws of prosperity, but she writes about so much more than prosperity. But once you sort of get that tag of whatever it is, that's kind of what you are. And so I was very drawn to Terry because she was teaching how new thought is you can create your life the way you want to. And so that was really what brought me in because I had lived much of my life as a victim of circumstances, as most of us do. That's sort of the just baseline human Earth mentality is victim. That doesn't mean that you have a bad life. There are very, very rich people who, rich, healthy people with fabulous mates who live as victims. The vast majority of the planet is in victim consciousness. And what is victim consciousness? It just means that things out there determine how I feel. That's 99.9999999% of the world lives in that. If something good happens today, I'll feel good. If something bad happens today, I'll feel bad. That's victim consciousness. That's all that is. The Kardashians are almost constantly in victim consciousness. <laughs> Yet they're famous for having done nothing and richer than God. <laughs> but if you watch their show, it's always about how somebody's not doing what I want them to do. That's the story of humanity is somebody's not doing what I want them to do. <laughs> Right? Whether it's my brother or my sister or the president or Congress or the, pee, the neighbor's car is in the thing and the, house and the dog won't, eh. <laughs> right? That's all victim consciousness is. And so I was looking to have some power. So I came in and then it was a horrible time to come into New Thought in a way because it all just sort of hit the skids. In fact, I remember, I don't know, Nobody here, well, some people here have been around as long as I have. When I came in, Fred Vogt, who was a religious science minister in Denver, was the head of whatever that was called at the time, the president of the Churches of Religious Science. And I remember a minister friend of mine taking me out to Palm Springs, wh where I live now, to this retreat where all the ministers were meeting. And I remember at that time, and I remember it bothered me at the time, and I thought, you know, he was so right. <laughs> he was so right because he saw the writing on the wall. They all drank like fish at that thing, by the way, <laughs> which was what made it so fun. Anyhow, they're probably all, you know, everybody's all sober now, but it was fun then. <laughs> so <laughs> he in particular, because uh, I remember him talking about in, in his big speech, he was saying, as religious scientists, what we believe in is five-step prayer treatment, period. That is what we teach. That's what the churches need to be teaching. That's what it's about. It's not about incense or crystals or a course in miracles or rebirthing or walking the whatever. Or It's not about any of that. It's about five-step prayer treatment. This is what we need to come back to. And then I remember him joking later. He said, at our church now, we're treating for luck. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But what happened was, is that a lot of New Thought churches started becoming interfaith ministries. And what it did was confuse the hell out of everybody without them knowing it, and it became a watered down version of nothing. So that we're teaching a little bit of everything, and a lot of it conflicts with each other, but what we're really trying to do is not offend anybody, and so we've become politically correct, and in order to not offend anybody, we can't really say anything. So we're just saying vague, politically correct things all the time. We're not teaching people the principle, and therefore, that's when a lot of the New Thought churches stopped having physical healings and stopped having growth and manifestations because then manifestation became a bad word. Because we're not really teaching people how to use the principle to enact and create the life we want. We're trying to be a compassionate, safe place. That's why I tell people in my classes, you're not safe with me. <laughs> Don't tell me your secrets, they're not safe with me. 
I don't have a big blanket to wrap you in and tell you it's going to be okay. What I run is a very strict boot camp. I'm going to tell you shit you don't want to hear because that's how growth happens. So within a short period of time in L.A., when I was in like early Science of Mind, Science of Mind one class or something, the minister there gave us the book to read, um, The Road Less Traveled. Well, nothing could be less new thought than The Road Less Traveled. The first line of that book is, life is difficult. <laughs> I'm like, this is, I could have stayed in Catholicism for this shit. <laughs> <laughs> this is not what I'm here for. But I went on a journey as a lot of people did. I studied probably Buddhism for 10 years, read all of those Buddhist teachers, did all of that, and never got any better in that aspect of my life of creating the life I wanted. But what I got to was a place of, I can be peaceful no matter what. And that was what a lot of that stuff taught too. And that's very good to know. That's the most important thing in many ways to know in life as a human being is how to be happy no matter what's happening. And that actually is where that saying, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, comes from. That quote, that part of it is meaningless without the part that comes before it. But people quote that all the time. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. No, that's not what you think it means. People use that as a quote to say, I can do anything. Like, I can create a car, I can heal this illness, I can da 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 That's not what that means. You have to read the part before it where Paul says, I can be rich or I can be poor, I can be loved or I can be betrayed, I can be sick or I can be well, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That's what he was talking about. I can be peaceful under any and all circumstances, whether I'm in jail and they're tormenting me or whether they're giving me a parade. I know how to guide my own consciousness. That's what Christ is. Christ is not a person. Christ is a level of consciousness. So in that Christ consciousness, or you could call it a Buddha consciousness, or it doesn't matter the word, you know what it means. Christ means the anointed one. That's all Christ means. Look it up. Google is your friend. <laughs> Christ means the anointed one. Well, anyone is anointed who wants to be. That's all. That is the, you do it with oil. I put a little oil on myself every day. I have a little oil. Christ. So the Christ conscious, I can do all things through that consciousness. I don't have to have things go my way in order to be happy. So it was very important for me to learn how to do that. But what I also found was there wasn't a lot of joy in any of those teachings. And so I knew how to be happy never having anything I wanted was that way for a long time, very peaceful, never having anything go my way. I knew how to guide my mind to be a mind that focuses on the positive. What's good in this situation? I have a bed to sleep in. I had food to eat today. I have some love in my life, all of these things. So I learned how to do that, but I still wasn't taking responsibility for my mind going in a certain direction. Now, what we're used to, again, in this culture, is focusing on trying to control everything that cannot be controlled and not controlling the one thing we can't control. <laughs> we are given a spirit of self-control. We are not given a spirit of other control. Controlling other people, controlling other circumstances or situations, we can influence other people in situations. But control, control has gotten a bad rap in this world because we realize that it really is not helpful to try to control other people. So we've just said, oh, control is bad, or you're a control freak. And we've just thrown the baby out with the bathwater instead of recognizing. But we do have control of ourselves, the control of our own mind. But oftentimes, we just renounce that power to situations. We say, I can't help feeling this way. Yes, you can. We feel the way we feel because of what we're thinking. That's what creates our feelings is the story that we're telling about what's happening. It's not what's happening. It's the story we're telling ourselves 
about what's happening. The fascinating thing to me about Chris Farley was that he was such a loving person, if you saw that documentary. And the word that all of these people said about him over and over and over and over and over again was how kind he was, how just genuinely, truly, honestly kind he was in a business that's not known for a lot of kindness. Right? I mean, people in show business are mostly thinking about getting ahead and doing the next thing and the next gig, and then you're sort of a little bit thinking about yourself mostly. But he was somebody who was so kind that all of these various you know, comedians and people that he worked with kept talking about how kind he was. So here he was, a very loving, kind, wonderful person, very funny, very talented, and the whole thing was about how uh, without, that he would just be the star wherever he was, basically. That he just was that being. And yet, such an amazingly deep feeling of self-hatred that one of the skits that uh, he would do that was pretty funny was he would have, it would be the Chris Farley show, and he would have on some celebrity. And they, what they were saying was that was the most what he was really like when you would see him in those skits, which was that he was very shy, and so it would be Paul McCartney, and he would be like, oh, I can't believe you're here. Remember when you were with the Beatles? Yeah. That was great. <laughs> like, he's just so shy. <laughs> and they said, that's really what he was really like. And then if you would compliment him and say, oh, you're a great person, he would say, I'm horrible. I'm a horrible person. I'm a terrible person. He had, I, I remember years ago taking a, you know, you take those magazine questionnaires. <laughs> so it was like one of those personality type things. And it said, you have the kind of guilt that most people would have if they had committed a serious crime. <laughs> well, that was kind of Chris Farley. And I will say this. I don't mean to be bashing. But I will say, Chris Farley and I both raised Catholic. <laughs> now, the, uh, this, is not, this is actually... Um, this is not bashing Catholicism, but this is... Catholicism, like a lot of things, is they are basically brainwashing you in a sense that you are saying these affirmations all the time. I went to Catholic school, so I was in mass six days a week. And what you would say as a congregation, you would say, oh my God, I'm heartily sorry for having offended thee and I detest all my sins because they... So everything you're saying as a congregant is, I'm not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. So this is all affirming, I'm worthless, I'm useless, I'm a sinner, I'm horrible. And then in front of you is a huge larger than life statue of a bleeding Jesus that you killed from your sin of having been born because the God is a God of blood sacrifice, it's a happy place. You just feel good about everyone and everything. You just feel happy, happy, so glad I came today. And, uh, <laughs> and so I, you know, I hadn't done anything, but I had that kind of guilt, and you could see that in Chris Farley. That he hadn't done anything, but he felt just evil for being alive, someone that everyone said was kind and wonderful. So of course, you know, one of the things that happens is if you feel really horrible about yourself and things start to go well for you, now you're really in trouble. You are really in trouble. I would say, you know, because then you have power and money, right? It, if you're poor, sometimes it takes you longer to destroy your life because you have to go to work <laughs> and shit, you know? When you have, <laughs> people won't put up with as much crap, but if you're rich, you know, you might have more free time and nobody will say no to you because you'll just fire them. And, you know, so it's like having gasoline a lot of times. So his path to self-destruction then was very short. Now, it was the same thing with Greg Louganis. Was now not so much necessarily that he was saying, but that he had a father who was kind of cold to him. And, and, uh, and also he was teased a lot for being gay and all of these things. So all of this was taken in while, again, also a life that from the outside looked very good. Right? He's winning gold medals and all of this stuff. But what was fascinating is, of course, that Chris Farley's life ended very early. Whereas Greg Louganis went on and on and on and on and on. And 
as you sort of watch the story as somebody who understands how consciousness operates and how your life works, it was so amazing that one of the reasons that he was so miserable for so long was simply the story he kept repeating over and over and over again. And the story was mostly about shit that happened 30 years ago, right? Because there's no awareness of how to be happy now. In the now, what's happening right now? And a lot of his misery in this movie was about trying to hold on to this stupid house in Malibu. Like sitting there and being like, I'm gonna lose my house and the house with my And you see the house is like a piece of crap by now anyhow because he didn't have the money to keep it up and all this stuff, but the house represented something. Right? The house was part of the story of who I am and what family is. So there's all this misery about holding onto the house and not making enough money and buying an RV in case they live in the RV and all this stuff in case he loses the house because he has to stop paying for it for a certain amount of time before the bank would let them redo the loan and all this crap. But still, this was the second documentary I'd seen about Greg Louganis. There was one that was made years ago and it was the same, and I was like, he's still telling the same story of like this happened and this person and that person and all this stuff. And then you wonder, why have I not moved on? Because there's not the mental control or awareness of, it's my story that's doing this to me. I am at the effect of the story that I am telling myself, not what's happening to me. Because if you looked at his life, you were like, you have a house in Malibu, you have a boyfriend that loves you, you have a wonderful dog, you, everybody, you've been, uh, you know, you've had gold medals, you have this and that. But he was sitting in his story waiting for somebody to do something. Right? <laughs> this is the thing somebody should do something. When's somebody going to recognize what I've accomplished or achieved or da 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 da? Well, you know what finally brought him out of it was that a couple of years ago, I guess, somebody, I don't know who, but somebody in, that has to do with the Olympics and diving invited him to come and coach. Well, once he got in to starting to coach other people, it comes back to what I say here all the time. Uh, don't take any of what I'm saying today personally. I'm just here talking to myself. That's all I've been doing for many, many years is I just go from place to place and stand on stage and talk to myself and charge people to listen. Because this shit ain't free. So I'm just talking to myself. Well, of course, as soon as Greg Louganis is in a situation where he's starting to tell younger people and coach them, who's receiving the benefit of it first? He is. Right? This is why the Course in Miracles says you're always teaching yourself. You're always talking to yourself. Always. You think you're talking to that other person. You think you're frustrated with that other person. Who are you frustrated with? No, no, no. I mean, who in your life are you frustrated with? Like, there's somebody in your life that you're frustrated with because they won't get it, they won't change, they won't do this, they're so stuck, they're so this, they're so that. Everything you want to tell them, just go home, look in the mirror, and say it. Because <laughs> it's really just about you, you know? I used to, when I was in Pennsylvania, when I was growing in Pennsylvania, my friend Karen, my first friend, in the world, like I met her when I was probably a week old or something. <laughs> She's a couple years older than me. Once I was old enough to drive and trap her in the car. Because <laughs> in rural Pennsylvania, it's all like rural roads and stuff. So you drive around in the mountains for, so we would just drive, like we would just drive. Like you just go, I don't know if people do that, around here. But you just go for long drives because there's just really nothing else to do. You go to the pizza shop eight times a night because that was the only thing in town. So you see it to who's at the pizza shop. Go in the parking lot. Still no one. Okay, take another drive. <laughs> so you just drive and drive and drive and drive. So you spend it. You might, you know, gas was not expensive at that particular time. So you would drive in the mountains for hours all night long and you have a big spotlight and you'd spot deer. So yes, yeah, very sophisticated life. And so I would trap her in the car and then I would give her sermons. 
because Karen was, and still is, to my knowledge, the most negative person who ever breathed air. <laughs> and so I would lecture her in the car about how she could be so much more, and she could be happy, and she could do this, and she could do that, and she could have dreams, and she could have visions. And so I would trap her. And I, in fact, <laughs> we still talk about the one day when she was quiet for a long time, and I said, what are you thinking? Because I was really like being brilliant. And I was like, what are you thinking? And she said, I was thinking, won't he ever shut up? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I would just talk to her and inspire her, in you know, on and on and on and on and on. Until one day, I was so good that I left Pennsylvania. <laughs> I had so completely fired myself up to, in telling her that she could do anything and she could achieve anything and she could have anything that I realized, well, I'm talking to myself, like, go. There's a book out now uh, that Louise Hay wrote with I can't remember, Robert Holden maybe, or one of those people, that's called Life Loves You. And in that, she said that when she first came to New Thought, when she first came to religious science, she said, I absolutely believed that the principle would work for other people. <laughs> she, said I, she said I would read it and I would be inspired and kind of pissed off because I knew it wouldn't work for me, but I knew it worked for other people. She said, but I kept reading it because I had to keep drinking it in and drinking it in. And they talk about that a little bit in the book, the belief that it will totally work for your brother who needs to get his ass in gear and have a better attitude and da 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 and affirm this and envision that and da da But my case is more complicated. Right? Our case is always more complicated. <laughs> so it is that saying it over and over until you get it. Right? And so that person that you're trying to fix, whatever it is that you're so wanting to say to them, you want to say that to yourself. Right? As you, that you, for you to keep receiving it. And so my journey has been coming around more and more and more to the realization of it's not one or the other. Like one of the things I talk about, and I read Pema Children for years. I read Sheila Borstein, I read uh, Jack Korn, whatever his name is, like everybody, all those people. For probably 10 years I read all that stuff, and all in the lighting and the sage and the meditation and the this and that, and I did all of that stuff. All very helpful in how to suffer elegantly. <laughs> very elegant suffering. <laughs> in a way, like just mild suffering. Because that's always the thing with Pema Children, and I love her, but honestly, she needs to get a grip. Because she will say things like, you know, oh, she's been doing this for 30 years. She said, but it's still hard to sit on the mat. I'm like, then stop doing it. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you? It's still hard. I still resist, and I still, what the hell? <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe it's not your path. <laughs> forcing love to work, forcing Buddhism to work. Because I stopped listening to her when I was listening to one of the tapes, and she said, she said, oh, I always forget about the joy. I'm like, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> she forgets about the joy. That explains a lot. <laughs> I always I was talking about her books are The Wisdom of No Escape, <laughs> When Things Fall Apart. The chapter titles, The Seven Kinds of Loneliness. <laughs> seven kinds of loneliness! <laughs> Who, wha, who's making those distinguishing nuances? The seven kinds of loneliness. <laughs> right? <laughs> but that was a time in my life when that made sense to me. I mean, I had gone through a period of time. My mother had died, my father had died, my sister had died, my grandmother had died. I was living in a place I didn't like, I didn't have any money. Like, there was a sh lot of shit going on that this seemed like true. Life is hard, it is suffering, and you just have to realize that and somehow be at peace with that. And it took me years to realize, like, oh, that's not true. That's not true at all that life is suffering. Life is joy. We're here to experience joy. We're not here to learn horrible lessons and grow. <laughs> We're here for joyful growth. 
for joyful expansion and joyful growth. This is Ernest Holmes, right? Is that God wants to expand through you as you. Joyful expansion, right? That life is like a garden. This is really what I've been talking about a lot lately, that life is like a garden. And we're just planting things. And a lot of us have been steered wrong, so we're planting things we don't want. And then we're going, I hate rutabagas. I plant them every year and nurse them, <laughs> and I hate them. I don't like the way they look or the way they taste. This is so unpleasant, <laughs> right? That we don't really, what's your garden? Plant something else. Make another choice. This is the thing is making choices. This is sometimes so hard with spiritual groups. It's getting people to make a decision and choose because a lot of times spiritual people are so passive. Because I always say, spiritual, I'm post-spiritual, if you didn't know that. <laughs> I am now post-spiritual. I'm really more into sci-fi now. <laughs> it's my whole new archetype, sci-fi. Much more into sci-fi than spirituality, because what I found is spirituality is religion in tie-dye. <laughs> it's just the same old shit. It's just wearing a scarf. <laughs> same old crap. That's why, I, you know, I kept telling people in the last month, I am pure new thought now. A new thought really is more in alignment with sci-fi anyhow, right? I'm now a superhero. I'm manifestation man. <laughs> I'm a superhero manifestation man, right? <laughs> oh, my God. So... The interesting thing then with, with Greg Luganus was that once he then started, to see, here's the thing that you have to get. It doesn't matter how long you've been going in the wrong direction. As soon as you start to go in the right direction, you're going in the right direction. <laughs> Did you get that? The very second you turn around and start, now you're going in the right direction. Already, instantly, like just that fast. See, we think, well, I've been going in the direction, wrong direction so long, it's going to take a long, long time to turn this thing around. No, it isn't. The second you turn around, now you're going in the right direction. <laughs> so Greg Luganus, the second that he is dropping the story of, I can't, I need, it's to, they did it to me, the banks are doing it to me, the economy's doing it to me, the Olympic people did it to me, all of this stuff. Once he got out of that and got into the mindset of starting to tell other people, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to focus on, immediately he had turned around. And the second he turned around, you start building momentum for the new direction. So that by the time this documentary was over, he, the, like the, the last, you know how at the end where it's like after we've already done filmed and everything and we're editing it all together, so now we just have to put it on a black card? So by the time, I think that's what it was. So by the time, it's a black card of like, Greg let go of the house. <laughs> it's like, finally, because that's the thing where you're like, let go of that stupid house. Right? These payments forever I have to hold on to the house. Finally, you're happy enough to let go of the thing that was killing you. The thing that you called your security that was actually killing you. He let that go because he was starting to feel happy. He's like, what the hell was I holding on to that stupid house for? So then it, the card was something like that he let go of the house, and now how much easier everything was because they were living at a place they loved that was well within their means. Right? That's what we talked for months and months about tiny house living when I was cleaning out my place. I would watch Hoarders and Tiny House Nation. <laughs> right? But you can, one of the things that I heard Michael Beckwith say like 20 years ago that was revelatory, so great, where he just said, spiritual growth is 99% letting go. <laughs> because we're always trying to gather up more. Like, not even just stuff, but more information. I need more information, right? It's like, no, there's too much in there now. <laughs> and most of it is horseshit. <laughs> we have to undo all of that stuff. 
<laughs> and leave simplicity. That's one of my favorite lines in The Course in Miracles that I quote is that it is simple, but simplicity is very difficult for twisted minds. So one of the things that I resisted for a long, long time was simplicity. And one of the ways that you insult people in new thought is to tell them, well, that's just a simplistic way of looking at things. Yeah, I know, isn't it great? Because <laughs> I was complicated for a long time. <laughs> and that shit sucks. <laughs> I like a nice simple, just simple. Does it, simple and easy are not the same thing. Right? E equals MC squared is simple, but that doesn't mean it's easy. So there's one of those live talks of Ernest Holmes. Uh, that they put out like 10 years ago or something that was uh, compiled from his live talks. He says, right in that talk, he says, I've always said this is simple. I've never said it's easy. It's one of the hardest things in the world to do for somebody who's going down a negative mental pattern to tell them something positive and have them accept it. It's one of the hardest things in the world because we don't want to accept the easy answer. We like the long, complicated, I used to, I wish I, I could remember, Ken Wilber, for those of you who've ever read any of Ken Wilber's stuff, told a story in one of his books about, and I don't know if it was really true or if it's just an anecdote, but he told a story about some Eastern guru who came over to the United States and basically, I'm, I tell these stories the way I remember them, which is to say inaccurately. <laughs> uh, but I will bend it to make my point. Um, but this is the way I remember it anyhow is that some you know, guru had come over here and basically his teaching was something like, you are the sacred self, there's nothing else, da, da, da. But well, there had been like a big hurrah about him coming and they had bi a big event and all these people came because he was this you know, revered sage or whatever. And once he said to an American group, you are the sacred self, that's it, that's all there is, people were like, what the hell? What do you mean, that, we came here for that shit? That doesn't mean anything. So. He went away and devised something like a 12-step plan. <laughs> and so you started at like number 12 and worked your way up to number one. And 12 was the most complicated. So 12 was about, you know, you meditated X numbers of day and you would do certain prostrations, you had incense and you would <laughs> and you know, everything was like a lot of stuff and you know, you would, you, sacrificial gatherings and all that. Then you got up to 11, there was a little less to do until you finally got up to number one, which is there's only the sacred self, there is nothing else. Because Americans could not accept anything being easy. It all had to be, this is what you call country club religion. This was really big, uh, I was a Mormon for a little while too. I tried them all on. I tried everything on. So I was a Mormon for a little while when I was in Brigham Young University, and I, that was the epitome of country club religion because it was, they had three levels of heaven. <laughs> so the highest level of heaven was only the Mormons, and then the two lower levels of heaven were other Christian people. But I said, it's a country club, it's like, oh darling, not everyone gets in. <laughs> Absolutely top draw for the Mormons. Right? So everything sort of a country club earning your way in so that the riffraff do not get in. Right? But this was the teaching of Jesus. This is why Jesus was not, you know, he was just hanging out wherever. He was to hang out with rich people. He would hang out with poor people. He would hang out with leaders. He would hang out with prostitutes. It was like it's equal to everybody. Everybody can grasp this truth, and this truth is very, very simple. And this, of course, is what outraged the religious people was that he would live by the spirit of the law and not the letter of law. So he's always getting in trouble for breaking the letter of the law. Like, you're not supposed to be eating today or you're not supposed to be working today because it's the Sabbath or it's this or you're not supposed to be doing that and you know, you're eating the wrong things or you're working and you're this or you're that. And he was always sort of saying that doesn't mean anything. So they didn't like that. The, you know, like the church people did not like that. There's only one way to get in, right? There's this way, and if you don't get in this way, you ain't getting in. Right? So we don't like the idea of it's really very simple. But that's the great equalizer then is the recognition that it's just consciousness. So that then you see that what doesn't seem fair is absolutely fair.
So it looks like, why is that person is thriving? They're a horrible person. They're mean and selfish and this and that. Why? Because they have the consciousness. That's all. They just have the consciousness. That's all. That's all it is. That's why I always say, by and large, most straight men, these are generalizations, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> different than women, different than gay men. Most straight men can get in a good relationship in 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> you can be a straight man living in a trailer that you are hoarding shit in, <laughs> drinking a keg of beer a day with one tooth in your head, <laughs> with a fourth grade education, sort of racist, <laughs> very smelly. <laughs> and within a very short period of time, not just get a woman, but a good woman, like someone like a nurse, <laughs> like someone with a degree or something, who will bring you your beer <laughs> and take care of you. Why? Because when that nurse looks in the mirror and she sees that extra seven pounds, she thinks that she is worthless. That guy looks at the one tooth in the mirror and says, you got it. <laughs> That's all his consciousness. My father, when I, the last time I saw my father, before he passed away, he, was, he looked like a cadaver. He was so tiny, and he was on a portable oxygen tank and like a little tiny. And we went to the Peggy's Diner, which is the diner in our town. We went to Peggy's Diner, and there was another old man who looked like a cadaver. And they were sitting there with me at this table, and the waitress, who would have been like Flo, like that's kind of how what she from Alice, like kind of like that. So she was about that age and about like that. They were after her. <laughs> A good 40 years older than her and at death's door and after her like as if, that's all you need to say, like as if. but talking to each other like they were 23 years old, still in World War II, out on leave, of like just five minutes with her. And it's like, what the hell? Like what, that kind of confidence. From the Crypt Keeper is unbelievable, right? But that was their consciousness, was like, oh, hey, you know? And that's, so when you begin to look and you see that that's all you're ever working on is your own consciousness. That's it, and that you're just a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, it's really one thought at a time. It's just one thought at a time. It's just a little bit more possibility here. That's what we're working on is to just, maybe it's, po I don't know how it's possible, but maybe it's possible, right? To just keep saying, to stop getting in that place of denying yourself your good because the only reason we deny ourselves our good is because we think at some level we don't deserve it. That's why I always tell people you don't live the life you deserve. You live the life you think you deserve. You live the life that you think you deserve, even if you protest that and say, I deserve so much more than this. You don't really believe that or you would be living it. So the work is then to let go of that, I do, I do that, and relax into, okay, let me just start to see how open to receive I am. How open to receive I am. This is it. How open to receive I am. That's a very different energy than a get energy. We're trying to get something. It's very different than I'm open to receive it, to allow it, to let it happen and to be guided by this inner wisdom as to whatever my part is. And your part is probably not that big. Again, there's a line in The Course in Miracles that says, 
<laughs> that's talking about, <laughs> it basically says, the problem that you have is that you have a hard time accepting how disproportionate your part is. Because you're used to thinking that you have to do so much to make things happen. To You know, it's like, um, it's understanding that it absolutely is a natural law. That a thought is a seed that goes out and takes root, and then it will grow if you take care of it in the right way. Just like, you know, one of the things that there's a misunderstanding about, let's see if I can clear it up or make it worse. <laughs> let's just see what we can do here. <laughs> Has to do with the idea of feeling something. One of the things that Neville Goddard talks about is feeling is the secret, that you have to get into the feeling place. But the misunderstanding around that is that then people think that it's about feeling something into happening. But Ernest Holmes was very clear. He said, you don't have to have any kind of feeling at all when you put a seed in the ground. Like you put a seed in the ground and you cover it with dirt and you water it and you make sure there's sunshine and you, you know, pull out the weeds or whatever and it's going to grow. You don't have to have a feeling about it. You don't say, oh, I need to get into feeling and imagine myself surrounded by flowers. You just go, it just works, because that's how it works. It just works, right? That's actually the feeling, is the feeling that it works, that I don't have to make it work. I'm not forcing the law to work. It's just, it'll work, because it works. That's how. And if it, doesn't, if it doesn't seem to be working, it's because there's some interference. So just like a garden, it's because you have not been checking on it in the right way, and so the bugs are eating it up, or there's something covering it so that the sun's not getting through. You're just doing like little daily mild maintenance. That's all. But our, that's how our work needs to be. It's just that little daily mild maintenance of our thought life, of, OK, what are you thinking? Are you preparing yourself for the worst today or preparing yourself for the best? Because that's going to make a huge difference. Right? I mean, I have to be super careful with stuff like this because, like, when I'm driving here and when I'm, I'm driving back, I can get in my mind of girding my loins. You know how you gird your loins? super early because there might be a lot of traffic because at one time there was that horrible accident and I don't want to run and it might be hot and whatever this and blah, blah. so you're you are basically subconsciously preparing for the worst you're not coming from the place of doesn't matter what happens because I always have what I need right that's the Louise Hay school of I always have what I need I always have what I need. that's the only way you can have peace by the way is living in the realm of I always have what I need so that if the car breaks down and I don't make it to class, that is exactly the best possible thing that could have happened today. I don't know why yet. I don't know why. But if you tie your happiness to, if I don't make it there, I'm a failure, it didn't work out, I disappointed people, my career is over. OK, I tell this story again. I just can't shut my mouth about things I shouldn't be saying. But I told this last week. Let's tell it on video now, Joel. <laughs> this is the I don't give a shit tour, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> it is funny, and it's not a bad story about her, but it is funny that many years ago, when, a, when um, The Healing of America came out, Marianne Williamson had written The Healing of America, and it was like her third or fourth book, and it was not a book that people were, at that time, particularly interested in. And so... It, the week that it came out, it did not like debut at a big number, and she was used to her books doing well. And she was living in Santa Barbara at the time, and I was, I think, living in L.A., but they were having a fundraiser for the local bookstore in Santa Barbara, so they were having her speak at this thing and do a signing and talking about the healing of America. And it was at the biggest theater in town, which was like 1,700 seats with like 100 people there. <laughs> so that does not look good when you're speaking and you look out at a huge auditorium and you see a few people scattered around. Now, she had been like on Good Morning America that week, okay, talking about this and doing press, and she was uh, in USA Today that day and all of this stuff. But we're standing backstage waiting, you know, for the right moment for me to go out and introduce her because they had asked me to come up and introduce her. And so 
we're standing backstage and we're looking out the curtain and we see this enormous theater unlike what looked like nobody there. And she looked at me and said, in all seriousness, because she always says everything like it's the most serious thing in the whole fucking universe, <laughs> she said to me, Jacob, do you think my career is over? <laughs> and it was everything that I could do to not say, I do, I think it's over. <laughs> you should make your apologies and go home. <laughs> because you're done. But it is that, like even that thought, that you're, right? That the mind is, I'm just going to be happy or unhappy according to appearances. So oftentimes, if something bad happens, then we constantly are girding our loins for that to happen later. Be prepared. But we don't realize that what that usually means is be prepared for the worst. Be prepared for things to go wrong. What if? Every week, when you went to the grocery store, you would buy just a little something, just in case a party broke out. <laughs> because you'd never know. Right, just one week, you would get three bottles of champagne. Another week, you might get you know, a platter. Another week, you might get whatever. I can guarantee you, a party would break out. Because we get what we prepare for. We're getting what we're preparing for. So that even if the thing doesn't actually happen, it happens. Do you know what I mean? Because you're living it. You're living it as if it's happened, right? That's Job. The thing I have greatly feared has come upon me. Right? Well, of course. Aren't you relieved? Right? You, there's a part of us that's relieved when the horrible thing happens because now we stop worrying about it happening. It's like, there's my painful phone call. Finally. I knew you would reject me. I knew it. Right? Now I can move on with my life and stop picking fights with you for no reason. Because we are, we're setting things up in a way. Instead of setting things up for, oh, my ultimate success, right? There is, a, if you really take this seriously, then you start just, one of the things that Ernest Holmes says is that, and it's so simple, that you just take one thought and neutralize it with an opposite thought. That's so genius. I have been doing that now for several years, and I can't tell you how it's changed my life because I want you to think about, like, first of all, I'll, I'll go back again to Catholicism. You know, everything is about the devil and you're sinful and all of this kind of stuff. So when I was a teenager was when The Exorcist came out. And so, um, of course, I was terrified. I saw The Exorcist, and then I was terrified that I was going to get possessed, and the devil was in my room all the time. So for about two years, I didn't sleep, and the lights were on 24 hours a day. No big deal. <laughs> Paranoid, terrified, you know, because the devil is real, and he's going to get you, and he's getting your body, and all this kind of stuff. And so now, this was not unusual. There were lots of people that thought this way. In fact, I remember years ago seeing Roseanne Barr, on the Barbara Walters special, the first Barbara Walters special she did, she said that she married her first husband because she was afraid she was getting possessed by the devil. <laughs> so uh, did anyone ever hear that story? It's so great. It's so Roseanne. So she was telling Barbara Walters, she said, yeah, my, my, my now husband, she said, we were living together. And they were, she was raised in Utah. She said, we were living together in a mobile home. And the Mormon missionary, and I had seen the exorcist, and I was afraid I was getting possessed because... You know, it put that fear into you. And she said, I, the Mormon missionaries knocked on our door one day, and I was home alone, and, I, and the Mormon missionaries were there. And she said, hey, listen, I'm afraid I'm getting possessed by the devil here. And they were like, well, that's because you're living in sin with this man. <laughs> so she married him. <laughs> so she wouldn't get possessed by the devil. So thought creates. Right? You understand that, that how thought 
let go gets us to do things. So one of the things that I realized was, again, when you look at the way the world is, particularly now, I mean, there's, there are times when there's more fear-mongering than others. Well, there is an awful lot of stuff now in the media, as, as far as movies and television and things like that, that have a very dark impulse to them. So there's a lot of supernatural things. There are a lot of things about, whether we're talking about s real supernatural things uh, having to do with demons and all of that kind of stuff that you see, or whether it's serial killers. There are lots of shows about serial killers now. Um, there are lots of shows about conspiracies and all this. So there's a huge dark impulse. What's fascinating, and the way the mind works is that, that's so bizarre to me, is that all of this, there's such a firm, almost cellular belief in people in evil and darkness and an entity, whether you use the religious term of Satan and the devil, or you dress it up in new thought terms and call it the ego, it's exactly the same thing. There's no such thing as the ego either, and to talk about it is a waste of your time. There's no such, doesn't exist. When you talk about it, you just make a fantasy real and then create a war with it, right? But there's no ego. You don't have an ego. An ego doesn't have you. There's no such thing. But we dress it up in tie-dye, say the ego, the ego, the ego. There's no such thing. What's fascinating is that the culture gives these things power but gives light no power at all. So what you see in all of these shows, particularly if they're supernatural, is that the demon or Satan has supernatural power, but the light has no power at all. So the demon can levitate things and make people do horrible things, but the power of light in God doesn't do anything. You've noticed it doesn't do anything. There's not like somebody shoots light out of their hands or nobody is like, there's nothing. It's just completely impotent to keep you terrified. So you start to look at the way the mind operates. So I was lived in fear for many, many years. I had a lot of superstitious religious thinking, and I've spent like years of undoing, undoing, undoing. That's not true. That's not real. That's not right. So that then what you begin to do is truly neutralize it with a different thought. One of the things, like my parents had terrified me for many years that the world is an unsafe, dangerous place, and as soon as you leave the house, somebody is going to try to kill you. Someone has a knife, has a gun, has a this, has a that. They're going to abduct you. They're going to murder you. They're going to whatever. The world is a just horrible, dangerous, dangerous place. So my initial, because of years of mind training and stuff like that, is like if my car breaks down along the side of the road, my thought is anyone who pulls up is the serial killer. <laughs> okay, Anyone or is the person who's going to kill you and take you to the so I've had to train myself to think that maybe the person who pulls up will be Brad Pitt. <laughs> like maybe, like you have to, you must take an opposing thought of what is the opposite of this thought, right? So that this, in my life now, when things happen that would normally scare me, where it's like, oh, maybe that's a demon in the corner, my mind goes right to probably angels over in the corner. Probably elves and leprechauns over in the corner. <laughs> Probably, like you start to move into the direction of, when instead of moving to the place of, maybe I'm going to get fired today, it's maybe I'm going to get a better job today. Right? Of constantly just saying, I, there's one of the lessons in A Course in Miracles is, has to do with this thought of controlling ourselves, which is, I rule my mind, which I alone must rule. What that means is I do not give the control of my mind to this magazine, to this television show, to this movie, to this administration, to this economic situation, to this, you know, we talked about when the big housing thing happened a few years ago and all of that stuff we were saying, I've decided not to participate in the recession. <laughs> I'm not going to participate in the recession. I've decided to vote out. I'm going to be participating elsewhere. And there are always people who thrive under any and all circumstances. Well, that's our divine destiny. And that's our inheritance. And it's the recognition that you don't earn your inheritance. You accept your inheritance. 
You accept your inheritance and say, oh, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It is the Father's good pleasure. We talked about this a few months ago, the recognition that you deny God pleasure by denying your good. That you give the universe pleasure by accepting your good, even if you don't deserve it in terms of having earned it. Does that make sense? All right, so that concludes that portion of the talk. <laughs> I have to do it nice and neat now for the CDs. <laughs> but I'm not done with you people. <laughs> no, 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 I'm close. Now, one of the things that is so important for us to do, you know, you don't hear about this much, I think, in New Thought churches. This is more something you would hear more in, like, maybe a Baptist church or something like that, where you talk about bearing witness. Bearing witness. What we want to do is be cognizant of bearing witness to principle in action. When Mary Baker Eddy wrote um, Science, the, her um, Science with Key to the Scriptures, at the end, the chapter on bearing witness was called fruitage. And what that was was just letters that were written to her by people saying that they had been healed through using Christian science. So this is really something for us to start to look at and to really create the space more and more where we are sharing the manifestations of good that come from practicing principle. One of the things <coughs> on my website, I have a blog and on the blog, <coughs> I, when people write in and talk about one of the things that I, I did was I used to call it miracle reports. But then you hit to recognize there's no such thing as miracles. This is very important for us to understand in New Thought. There's no such thing as miracles. When A Course in Miracles talks about miracles, it's not talking about what the world is talking about when it talks about miracles. A Course in Miracles means by miracles that you have basically forgiven. So it's really not a course in miracles. It's a course in forgiveness. It's a course in peace. I think the word miracle came because Helen was so holding grudges that it would be a miracle for her to let go of one. <laughs> That's why it was called a course in miracles. She wasn't going to forgive any freaking buddy. So when she did, it would be like a miracle that she would see the innocence in somebody that she was sure was the cause of all her pain. Because the course in miracles is not about what you and I in the world talk about miracles, it's not about somebody's cancer being gone or the money coming through or anything. The Course in Miracles calls that mind magic. So what we're talking about is, yeah, bring on the frickin' magic. We used to think like, no magic. Yeah, bring on the magic. I'd love to see some magic, so I'm totally into magic now. Which is really just the manifestation of your thought. That's all that is. So to say that something is a miracle means you don't understand how law works. Because what you and I would call miracles before, we now see, are just the outworking of law. Right? That's all it is. If something physical changes, it wasn't that some god out there intervened and changed law. It was that was the outworking of that person's consciousness. But that's invisible, so it looks like a miracle to us. We don't know how that change occurred in consciousness. So there's no such thing as a miracle. Everything is cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. So when you start to look at that and say, okay, let's bear witness now to, instead of bearing witness to, because whatever you're focusing on, you're getting more of. So let's start bearing witness now to the places where this is working. So I changed them from miracle reports to garden reports where, okay, this person has been sowing this seed in consciousness, and now these results are starting to come through. So when you look there, it's usually filled with, you can go to the, go to jacobglass.com, then there's a, at the top, there's a thing that says blog. If you go into the blog, then <coughs> there's also a thing that says categories, and if you click on the one that says fruitage, it brings up like years worth of what were miracle reports that are now called garden reports, that are people that have written to me saying, I you know, come to the lectures, I read the books, I do this, and I did this, and this is what has happened. So that you begin bearing witness to how this works. 
that it's not freaky, it's not weird, it's not unusual, it's as normal as putting a seed in the ground, watering it, watching it come up, and being happy about it. Being happy about it. Expecting things to work out. That it's a very normal process. And when it looks like it's not working, then it just means we have to adjust somewhere. That's all. Somewhere there's some resistance, a little. And to not make ourselves wrong based on. See, it's only judging according to appearances that makes us upset about something that's manifested. If I get sick, I don't feel like I'm a failure. I don't go like, oh, bad metaphysician. I shouldn't be sick. What's wrong with me? How did I create this? What's wrong with me? I don't even think. I just go, who the hell cares? The answer is the same in every single situation, which is <sighs> choose something else. Not a different condition. Choose a different thought. Choose a different thought. If this is happening and you're resisting it and you think it's bad, then the resistance is going to make it worse. I don't resist if I'm ill. I don't resist my financial condition. I don't resist a relationship going awry. I go, <sighs> Time to choose a new thought, a non-resistant, downstream, relaxed thought, and make a different choice. How do I want to feel? OK, I feel this way. How do I want to feel? OK, I want to feel this way. What's a thought that will lead me to that feeling? That's all. Just what's a thought that will lead me to that feeling? It's usually very general thoughts, like lots can happen. You can love being sick. Do you know that? I am still, to some degree, a metaphysician and hypochondriac. <laughs> so when I get sick, I'm always dying. <laughs> I don't have a cold. I have cancer. <laughs> right? This, and I just embrace it. Who can't? Like, there's no prize for staying here. <laughs> Did you know that? Every, we're all headed out, ladies and gentlemen. No one is staying. We're all headed out, some on the 1015, some on the 130, some on the 510, but we're all headed out. Earth is a big temp job. Don't get attached to your cubicle. None of this shit belongs to you. It's all going back to headquarters, including this thing. We are infinite, limitless, eternal consciousness temporarily using a physical body. That's all. So if the body is sick, it's like, so what? You don't want to keep this thing. For, would you want to keep the same car forever? I'm never going to want to drive anything but this forever. <laughs> no. So some people change bodies a lot. We have to take the broader perspective. If an infant lives six months, that was an entire fulfilled life. That was a whole, complete, entire, fulfilled uh, incarnation in the physical. That's it. There's no, there's no like, oh, you got to 105. Yeah. It's great if you got to 105 and you were happy all along the way. But there are lots of people that get to 70 miserable every day and making sure other people aren't having any fun either. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really not about the form. That's the, the freedom in realizing that you can be happy under any and all circumstances. You can be peaceful under any and all circumstances. But that doesn't mean, OK, so then I won't make any choices. I will just lay down and let l life roll over me. Because then there's no aliveness in that. There's no joy in that, really. It is in making choices that we start to feel the joy in us arising. One of the things that I was a theater major, uh, believe it or not, in <laughs> college. <laughs> Hard to believe. I was a theater major in college. A actually, I was an acting major. Well, one of the things that you know, the very second that you take, even if you would take a community acting class, uh, one of the things that they would teach you is when you're playing a character, the first thing that you really have to know in order to play a character is what does that character want? 
that's going to drive everything that happens in the play, in the movie, in the whatever, is what is it that that character wants. That's how we come alive, is by knowing what we want. And oftentimes, we're, I say, spiritualized out of the idea of wanting anything. Oh, you shouldn't want anything. And it's that spiritualizing that uh, you should just want God's will. That is such horseshit. Because what that implies when you say it that way is that there is a Santa God who wants you to live in Ohio and be a seventh grade teacher. That that's God's will. God's will is completely without form. It's only about content. So God's will is your joy and peace and happiness. So if it would make you happy to live in Ohio and be a seventh grade teacher, then that's God's will. But you get to choose. And not choosing is choosing by default. The Course in Miracles says the mind is always creating even when you're asleep it never stops. So what it's doing is it's creating whatever is in your consciousness. So if you're not choosing, I would like abundance and health and love and peace, then it's just going to go to whatever is your default setting. And your default setting is going to be based on your past. So if you had a fabulous past, you're probably not in this room. Right? Like if all my parents just encouraged every single thing I did and all my relationships have worked out and I'm at my ideal weight and health and everything's going well and I just don't even know what to do with all this money. Everyone always says yes to me and always happy to be wherever I am and I don't know if I'm going to spend this weekend in my house in Laguna or Paris. Right? Most of us have had some, you know, like a mixed bag of like some things that, you know, like I always say that um, this... Are we still on video? Well, I'm going to say it anyhow. The, I always say that my family mottos was, we're limited and fucked. <laughs> so that's my default. If I don't make a choice other than that, that's my default, because that's sort of how our family operated, was if anything happened, then my parents would go right into, oh, well, yeah. I mean, I, I was just, even now I still remember. I just remembered this week something that my father used to say about money that like made so much sense then in the way that I was raised around money is if there was something where we needed money, he would always talk about scratching up some money. Well, I'll see if I can scratch up some, right? That's a mindset. That's a consciousness of, not the consciousness of, oh, well, you know, there's plenty of money, and I'll do this, or I'll do that, or whatever. It's, I'm going to scratch it up. Like, it's something that you have to uh, scratch it up. Like, now, now, listen, my parents are two generations older than me. So they were the age that my grandparents really would have been. So both of my parents lived through the Depression. Neither one of them went past the seventh grade. Neither one of them ever read a book. So... From the consciousness that they were at, they did an amazing job with me. Like considering what they were exposed to and what they had to live through, they did an amazing, like supernaturally so. Like when I look back, I go, well, how the hell did that happen? Like that my father, who never read a book in his life, who never got past, I think he quit second grade or something, and went to work digging ditches and stuff, literally like lived in a shack with his family like Loretta Lynn, like I was born a cold, like dirt floors and shit like that, and lived that way, was taking me and my mother to a chiropractor in the 1960s. You didn't drive an hour. You might as well have said to your neighbors, we're going to see a witch doctor where we will bite the head off a chicken and drink its blood. <laughs> So like the shit that we did, like that was like wild, the mindset that they would have where in one area they would be so limited and shut down and of that sort of depression area thinking. And then in some other area have this whole open, like my father, long before people were doing this, was taking fistfuls of vitamins every morning 
and just uh, just crazy things that I think, wow, that's really amazing. So I don't look at that as like, you know, I I had a bad childhood. I just look and say, I can see where the areas where my default is is good comes from that open-mindedness they have and all of that, and where I have the default that things are difficult, that's the default. So that's where I work, is in that place where, okay, if I just, if I don't decide what I want and I just say, oh, I'm just going to leave it to God's will, then it's all going to be shit. Because <laughs> it's just going to go to my default of relationships are hard and people are a pain in the ass. <laughs> right? But if I choose, okay, I believe the best about people, and I'm attracting wonderful people into my life now, and I enjoy whoever I'm with. And this is, these are the kinds of relationships I want. This is Ernest Holmes. Lots of, in lots of Ernest Holmes books, there'll be treatments for attracting friends. A treatment for attract. This is how much we're supposed to be doing treatment, that we're not leaving anything up to, well, we'll see what happens. It's what kind, he says, you cannot treat specifically, this is the thing that we have to get. We can't treat for anything that interferes with somebody else's will. Because this is the one thing that is not violated, is everyone's will. We all have free will. So you cannot treat for a certain person to be your friend. But you can treat for a kind of person to be your friend. I want somebody who's interested in this, who likes to do that, who da 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 But you can't say, but I want Bob to be my friend, okay? Because Bob gets to decide. Bob is my go-to guy, by the way. In all my lectures, Bob is the guy. <laughs> and years ago, when I was lecturing at Pacific Church, the guy greeter at the door was Bob. And finally, he came to me and said, I wish you'd pick a different name. <laughs> Right? You can't say, I want to work for that company, because that company has free will. But you can say, I want to work for that kind of company that has this kind of ethical whatever and pays this well and all of that kind of stuff. But that we are not leaving things up to the universe, because the universe is leaving it up to you. The universe is just saying, yes, yes, whatever you focus on, yes, 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 yes. And this is why, at this particular time, I'm telling you, post a guard at the door of your mind because we're coming up on an election year. <laughs> and you're going to want to get firmly on your team. And your team is separation and pushing against. And here's how this works. When I said this in Santa Barbara years ago, it so outraged a guy, I thought that we would have to have him put in a straitjacket. Whatever you focus on in election year is what you will get. So if you are pushing against the other people's candidate, you've guaranteed that he will be elected. The more you talk about how you don't like her or him, the more you are putting them into office. Because everything you focus on, the universe is saying, oh, yes, 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 yes. Right? That's that saying, show me a man who is for something and against nothing. Whatever you are against, you are literally conjuring into your experience by your focus upon it. As you focus, instead of, what do I want? That's what I was talking about earlier. Instead of thinking about, oh, there's no demons, there's no devils, there's no this, no, there's no that, that, then all your attention is on that. Instead of saying, everywhere I go, there's hidden angels. Right? There are little leprechauns waiting to bless me. There is stardust being strewn in my path. Right? All that really is going on is the story that we're narrating in our head. We think we're talking about reality. We're not. We're talking about our version of things. And this is the idea behind having archetypes. That's why I'm manifestation man now. <laughs> All of my old archetypes, I realized, were spiritual and religious, and therefore had a lot of guilt and crap with them. So I left behind the idea of being a monk or a shaman or a this or a that because there was so much horseshit with it. <laughs> Manifestation man has none of that. <laughs> he is just traveling the light beams of the cosmos, calling in more of what he is wanting, going from place to place. Right? But there's that thing. You need that all to find the archetype where 
when you bring in the archetype, you haven't brought in a whole freaking shadow side of it now to deal with, right? This is one, one of the, somebody sent me a letter recently. Are we still videoing? Yeah. God help us all. Oh. <laughs> More things I shouldn't be saying. But somebody sent me a, a, an email uh, saying, <laughs> one of the things that it's very difficult sometimes for me to get across to people is how easy this is in sense of that you don't have to do that much, but you just have to be willing to do what you need to do. There's a line in The Course in Miracles that says, where, where the Holy Spirit says, you still haven't done the one thing I've asked you to do. And it's kind of like that. Like, there's really only one thing to do, and we would like to do 500 things, but not that thing. <laughs> like, I don't really want to control and guide my mind. What I would really like to do is go on this retreat and do forgiveness exercises and scream into pillows and go on a juice fast and... You know, <laughs> I would like to do all of that, get on some antidepressants, maybe have some lecture shock therapy, get some body work. But I don't want to just guide and control my mind. So it's hard sometimes for me to get across to people that really, it's really not that hard. We make it hard. There's really not that much to do. But if you just consistently do the little thing that you need to do, it's amazing how smoothly things will go. If you're just with, like the happiness boot camp I have where you're just every morning, you're writing down, this is what I love. I even took out, used to be a gratitude list. Then we realized even that was too religious for some people because they started to feel like I should be grateful. So we took that and then we said, now it's just a what you love list. So it's what do you love? Pens and paper, <laughs> making out, coffee in the morning reading Joel Goldsmith. So it just gets you, oh, man, I love this. I love this. I love this. <laughs> What's great about today? Oh, the sun is shining. Oh, it's raining hard. Like whatever it is that to you is great today, that you're just doing those little things in the morning to guide your mind. Where I got it right, I breathed in and out all day yesterday. <laughs> right? I made a bank deposit, right? I just, you just... Uh, Right, because your mind is going where you blew it, where you where you failed, where you didn't get it right. So you're just reversing all of that with one little thought. And then you're going, okay, what went right? Because your mind is already saying, I got a flat tire, that check bounced. So you don't have to write any of that shit down. <laughs> so it's a, where what went right? What went right? Oh, I got that nice card of encouragement. Oh, the fla those flowers, the anonymous flowers came, and um, somebody smiled at me at the bank. So you're just keeping track. You're just guiding your mind. It's just a little little, little guiding your mind. But it's just the willingness to go in that direction. So somebody sent me, and this is kind of her issue, and she's been listening to me for about a year and a half now or so. And I knew this, I can sort of tell, because I've been with people a long time, that she is somebody who had, when she came in, a lot of stuff where she was studying a lot of different things. And a lot of things that conflict with each other, and a lot of things that have things you have to do Right? And so she'd be with this teacher, and you have to do all of these things, and this teacher, you have to do all of these things, and this book, and you have to do all of these things. So as she's listened to me, she's like doing less and less and less. And I never, never said to her, you need to stop. But I would say, she writes me when she wants somebody to validate, that's just a lot of shit. Because I have not, I don't care about saying that. Like, I'll just be, she'll go, well, this teacher said I have to do this and this and this and this. And I go, if it's fun to do that, do it. But it's just a bunch of shit. And she'll go, oh, thank God you said that. That's what I thought. <laughs> but, there, you know, she's afraid to say it because this spiritual teacher said you have to blah, 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 blah. And I'll go, Pfft. right? The last thing that she sent me was she said, um, she said, and it's gone like little, and she wrote me, she said um, about chakras, do we need to do chakra work? Should I do chakra work? And I said, there's no such thing as a chakra. That's somebody made that up. Like somebody made up, there's these seven energy centers and they swirl around and there are these colors and there are these different flowers and this chakra means this and this chakra means that and da 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 da. I said, somebody just made that up. If it makes you happy and you feel good doing it, then do it. But don't do it because you should be doing it. And let me just tell you, I wrote this, let me just, because I, I know now I've been crazy enough. I know, I know. So I said, let me just say one thing to you that will save you some time. There's no such thing as a blocked chakra. Not only is there no such thing as a chakra, but there's no such thing as a blocked chakra. <laughs> so you don't need anybody to clean your blocked chakra. Okay, let me just, so, but if you 
feel like maybe you have a blocked chakra, I said to her, then what you need to do is just affirm, every time I inhale, it opens all my chakras. <laughs> so she wrote, right, she was like, thank you. So that was like about two weeks ago. So then she wrote me about, and people know now that I've been talking about being post-spiritual, and just the tyranny of spirituality is just as tyrannous as religion, but with more clever language. So we dress it up, right? So she was talking about the spiritual teacher who would basically chastised her and said, because she's, she's in some class. A lot of these things are on the phones now. They're teleclasses and stuff. So she's like, did you do the reading? And she said, well, I've been busy selling my house and doing this, and I didn't really have time, so I was doing this. And the teacher basically chastised her and said, you don't need to be cocky and think you have it all down now. You need to commit to doing it. You need to read it. And get it. <laughs> and she was, like, very upset. And she said, so she had written me, and she said, I just want to say, she said, thank you for not constantly in your talks talk about healing everything all the time. She said, because it makes me feel like we have all these wounds that we're going to be healing forever and never be finished with. And she said, one of the things that I realized is as I join all of these teleclasses and these online groups, then you get on the phone with them, and then the call is always monopolized by whoever's the most wounded person. And they just take up all the time about healing all of this stuff. But you know, now this, again, this is something that I said years ago that outraged people. I'm going to do both sides of it so you can feel good as you leave either way. <laughs> is the real truth is there is nothing fucking wrong with you. You're not wounded. You're not broken. You're not damaged. You're totally Move on. <laughs> OK. That so totally outraged some people whose entire self-definition was of being a victim that they almost, I thought their head would freaking explode. So angry. So let's go to the other side in case that's you. <laughs> you are probably wildly fucked up and broken beyond all <laughs> repair. <laughs> but there is no reason for that to slow you down or stop you in any way. And I'll quickly tell this story. Because, <laughs> like, because I, I told this story here a while ago, but, um, in the interim between the, whatever's the, like the late, late show where the old host quit and the new host had not started yet, they had people just filling in as guest hosts. So one night they had Lena Dunham and Adam Sandler and the guy who, do, who produces their movies, I can't remember his name, and then this other girl, comedian, who I really love. And they were all basically talking about how super freaking damaged they were. And, like, and very funny, but true, of like, oh, yeah, I had like major OCD, and I used to have to do this, and I would have to do that. And then they, were, they even talked about Chris Farley. Adam Sandler was saying about Chris Farley, he said he had such severe OCD about licking things, because Lena Dunham has a licking thing. So he said he has such a severe licking thing that if you were walking down the street with Chris Farley, he would like say, wait a minute, and then he would run a block back to go lick a mailbox. And then you have to wait for him to come. And the other woman, the woman, I can't remember her name, Maria Bamford, I think is her name. She was actually literally like in the asylum and put away and all that kind of stuff and all this stuff. And she was talking about how like she had thoughts of like if she didn't sing this one song, she would become a lesbian. <laughs> like, like stuff like that. <laughs> so they were all talking about all the crazy like weird stuff they believed and the phobias they had and all this kind of stuff. And all sitting there like rich, and in relationships, and famous, and creative, and happy. So it doesn't even matter if you are so freaking damaged, you can hardly have a clear thought. You can still live the life of your dreams. <laughs> so either way, why heal that shit? That might be what's making you rich. <laughs> <laughs> but it is the, but, so we can go either way. But the idea was, 
<laughs> that she was thank that this one was thanking me for in this letter was thank you for just not because that's what that was the catastrophe to me that happened that goes back to the beginning with Fred Vogt was that when new thought came in it really was about we're all kind of happy we all have problems but we can use this, this was how Ernest Holmes started out all of his radio broadcasts. There is a power for good in the universe, and you can use it. And that was really the light that drew people in of there is. God is for you, loves you, wants you to have whatever you want. You can use this power for good. But somewhere in the 80s, it became a place where wounded people came to be safe. And they never fucking got better. So they've been sitting there wounded for years. And it all became about, we know you're all wounded. We know life is scary. We know life is suffering. We know that you shouldn't want things because wanting is the root of all suffering. But we're all here, and you're safe here. And we're just all going to sing a song and say an affirmation. We'll be come back next week. Right? Right, which is why I love religious science churches now. We're like, you're going to get the class. They're going to talk about Ernest Holmes. You're going to get principle. Right? Like, we're going to teach you principle. And the more the church sticks to principle, the more it begins to thrive. Listen, metaphysical churches are so fringe, tiny and getting smaller all the time because they've become these interfaith ministries that really aren't teaching what they came to teach. But if you teach principle and live it, then you like will attract like. If you are not, if you don't back down from principle, but oftentimes we back down from the principle so that nobody will be offended. And if you are running a group where nobody's offended, you're running a group where nobody's saying anything. Nothing is really happening. Nothing's really being said. But if you can say, this is the principle, it's not personal. I don't like it necessarily, but this is what the principle is. I don't necessarily like gravity, <laughs> right? considering what it's done to some of me. <laughs> but I can appreciate it because it keeps me from floating up into the ceiling, right? So I know how to use it, <laughs> right? Right, there are parts that I don't necessarily like, but okay, I know how to cooperate with it. I can't change gravity, but I can cooperate with it in a way so that we are co-creators of my experience. Right? So she was saying to me in this letter, thank you for not intimating that we're damaged and we need healing all the time. Because that's one of the things, that's why I said, I even let go of that idea of being a shaman because then you're wondering why, how's come everyone who comes around me is sick? <laughs> oh, yeah, because you're a shaman, asshole. <laughs> like, you're basically saying, you know, bring me, you're tired, you're poor, you're hungry, your huddled mass is yearning to breathe free, I left my lamp beside a golden door. And then you're saying, where'd all these homeless people come from? <laughs> right? It's what you're sending out. Like when you send out the message of, like, this is what we're here for, we assume that you're okay. We're assuming you have issues and problems because that's just the nature that you're always working something out. But that's not the focus, right? That, that you're not coming somewhere to be fixed. That church, that spiritual groups are not God's emergency room. Oh, I'm broken and I got dumped again. I'll go back to church. Like, that's not really what it's for. What it's really for is like when you go to yoga class of like, I'm not even here to learn anything new. You're not going to probably learn anything new in yoga class. They're going to teach you those same moves you've been doing over and over and over and over again. That's really what this is about. It's like, that's right. I got out there. I got all twisted up and a knot and everything and all stiff and sore. I went, Oh, that's right. It's so easy. You just drop it. Oh, yeah. It's not. I was thinking it was hard. It's not hard at all. It's just stop resisting. Just stop the resistance. Just relax. Stop the resistance. Like this. Okay, this is, I swear I'm going to finish now. No, I'm not. I have two more things to say. <laughs> One is, okay, well, let me just say, I want to tell, tell a Claude Bristol story. Here's the thing. What we want to get to is the point where no matter what happens, the first thought we think is to go to treatment or affirmation. That that's the first thought we have, that that's our practice, is to get so good at this that we're like Louise Hay. Like when someone said to Louise Hay, let's do this, we can kill two birds with one stone, and Louise said, why would we kill birds? 
like that you just become that quickly aligned with truth and joy and peace. So what's amazing with these garden reports is that they are the exception to our normal lives, but they really should be almost every moment of our lives. Of where constantly, instead of a story of like, well, in this situation, I practice principle and then it works, and I'll try it again when something comes up. Instead of just all day long, I'm constantly using principle by guiding my thoughts in that direction. So that one of the things that happened was, because then you, you read something and you go, listen, I have so many books, they all say exactly the same thing. What I will do oftentimes now is I will, I read them and highlight them. Let me teach you about highlighting. I learned this in the Mormon church. <laughs> red pencils. If you get a nice red pencil, you especially you can highlight your Bible or your Course in Miracles where it has that really thin paper because if you use a yellow highlighter, it bleeds through everything. You know? So you use two different colors because if you're like me and you highlight a lot, you highlight so much, the only thing that stands out is the part that is not highlighted. <laughs> so if you get a yellow highlighter and a red pencil, then you highlight. So what I do now is, and I just did it this morning, I just went into the bookstore and bought like five or six books, is you read and highlight the book, then you give it away and rebuy it. <laughs> highlight it again. Not right away, but this is what I do. Like I will finish highlighting this book, then I will put it away, and in two years I'll buy the same freaking book and I will highlight it all over again. Because we don't need new information. There's not that much to learn. It could all be put on a pamphlet. <laughs> Thought creates. That's all you really need to know. Right, that's that bumper sticker. That's, that's not even a big bumper sticker. Thought creates. That's all there basically is to new thought. Thought creates. So this books just say the same thing over and over and over again. But why do I have to read them all the time? Why do I have them everywhere? I have to keep rebuying them over and over and over again? Because the whole world speaks to the contrary. The whole world says, oh, no, you are at the effect of the government, the environment, the philosophy you're under, the town that you live in, the age of your body, your past history, right? So you have to just keep being reminded all the time, oh, no, it's really very simple. Change your thinking, change your life. That came from religious science, really. Change your thinking, change your life. Change your thinking, change your life. Change your thinking, change your life. You change your thinking, you change the way you feel. You change your thinking, you've changed your vibration. You change your thinking, you've changed your consciousness. You change what you're aligned with. So the problem is, is that we do it now and then. We read something and then we go, oh, I'll do that. So one of the books that I had read was by Claude Bristol who wrote The Magic of Believing. But this was a very small book called TNT. Don't get it, it's kind of racist because um, of when it was written. It's, not, it's just words that he uses. It's also sexist and probably homophobic. You don't need it. I'm going to tell you everything that you need to know. <laughs> it was all basically on one freaking page. And it was, that <laughs> it was about people who succeed in life. He said, they are headliners. They are headliners. So he named like, you know, Dale Carnegie or people who were people of the time. They're headliners. They think of themselves as headliners. So I was like, oh, I love that. So I just started wrote a little post-it that I put on my mirror that said, I am a headliner. I'm a headliner. I'm a headliner. I'm a headliner. I'm a headliner. <laughs> Take a class, headliner. So I had been at the time filling in for Marianne Williamson off and on for maybe like two years or something like that at this big theater in Los Angeles, the Saban. It's a big, beautiful Art Deco theater on Wilshire Boulevard. And that very week when I had written and just gotten a kick out of I'm a headliner. Don't you know the one and only time that this ever happened was when I came that night and pulled up to the theater on the marquee, Jacob Glass was on my, and I was like, this shit works. <laughs> now, if I'd been trying to make that happen, it wouldn't have happened. Why? Because when you try to make something happen, you have tension and resistance. You actually block when you're trying to make something happen through thought or prayer or anything. What you're doing is aligning and allowing things to happen, and you expect things to go well. So that's it. Those are the little, that's the word. I'm bringing in this word. I resisted this word for years. Now I love these two words, manifestation and demonstration. Very big religious science word, demonstration. 
what are you demonstrating in your life? Well, we don't want to demonstrate cars and money and relationships and all of those things. What we want to demonstrate is God consciousness. Do you see? Because God consciousness is an abundance of all things. So it will come as marquees and books and cars and relationships and houses and all of those things. But if you think about the specifics too much, you bring in resistance and stress because your mind starts to think, how can I make that happen? How could that happen? How would that happen at my age? How would that happen to da 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 But if you instead say, in the area of cars, what I want to do is demonstrate God consciousness. In the area of romantic relationships, you know what I've decided? I want a harem of hotties. <laughs> Just a harem of hotties. I am not a monogamous kind of person. I'm not a long-term relationship kind of person. I'm a harem of hotties kind of person. Like just like a little core group <laughs> of congenial people who match, who are a vibrational match to the things that I like, and so on and so forth, right? So you just think, in that area, I would like to demonstrate God consciousness, the universe that says yes and is in your favor. But this is big. This is big. I have no signs of slowing down. Uh, I know we're like, well, I'll be here till 8 o'clock tonight, so you, if you need to go, just go right ahead. <laughs> Seriously, what you have to do is get into the place where, now I'm saying this publicly, apparently on YouTube, uh, but you don't need to do it publicly, but what you absolutely have to do is make it okay to choose what you choose. Do you understand that? To be able to say, oh, society says I should, well, now I'm, I can get married now, I'm gay. I should get married. Anytime your goals don't sound delightfully fun to you, they're not your goals. You have taken on the goals of a culture or a parent or a group or something that is not you. Your goals should sound fun to you, or they are not your goals. So you have to be at the place more and more where you make it okay to want what you want. You don't have to tell it to anybody. I tell everything to everybody. But you don't have to tell it to anybody. <laughs> but you have to make it so okay with yourself that you would not be ashamed to say it to somebody. Say. This is what I want in my life. I want my life to be like this and this and this and this and this. And for it to not matter if your parents would approve, you know, the, the freedom that comes when you stop trying to get approval. Oh, my God, Becky. <laughs> the freedom that comes when you stop trying to get the approval of other people. And particularly, you know, I always say, Every movie is kind of the same movie. Every story is kind of the same basic story. Where, and you notice this over and over and over again of how much of life, just like with Greg Louganis, is based on some story from the dead past that's not here and that's not happening anymore. And trying to prove yourself oftentimes to people who aren't even alive anymore some long dead parent or grandparent or teacher. And I always go back to people who say, you know, because it's so telling. What many people call the greatest movie ever is Citizen Kane. Well, that tells it all right there. Rosebud. Rosebud. <laughs> Rosebud's that fucking sled. Why? Because the sled represented his mother rejecting him and giving him away. So his whole life wasn't lived according to what he wanted. He'd lived an entire life trying to prove that he was somebody who mattered and shouldn't have been given away. I'll make the whole world know that I am an important person with power and wealth, and none of it meant anything to him because he was still living in a long, dead past. Instead of saying, what do I want? You know what? I am going to stop now, I swear. <laughs> Imagine if nobody else existed. 
then decide what you would want. If you were the only one and nothing you did would impress anyone, would make anyone love you or not love you, that you living your way would not have anyone reject you, now that's your truth. What you want that has nothing to do with anybody else but what you think would be a great way to live your life. And then remind yourself, there's a power for good in the universe, and I not only can use it, I am using it all the time. Now the job is just to use it more consciously all the time. Right? Let's do a prayer. Again, we close our eyes, taking a deep breath. Ah. <sighs> Letting go now of everything except the joy and the peace that comes from alignment with source. The great infinite is that is within you and everywhere, the center and the circumference, the alpha and the omega. There is no place where this divine love and presence is absent or needed. It is always right here responding to our thoughts, our words, our feelings, our images. That there is no God that is denying us anything. There is no universe that is withholding anything from us. And if there is any problem in our life right now, all that is required is for us to relax the tension, release, and go downstream, to stop fighting against it, to instead let the wisdom of the universe move through us, to know that right here and right now, all things are moving towards a happy conclusion, that only good lies before us, that the peace of God is in us and for us now, that every breath that we take brings greater health, clarity of thought, health of the body and mind, that all of our relationships right now are becoming more harmonious, more loving, that the people who drift out of our lives were simply no longer a match for us that we are calling every moment into our lives those with whom we can experience the greatest joy and love and understanding. That our work and our play is greatly satisfying. That we grow through joy and love and not through pain and hardship. That we are coming to understand more and more every day how much good we deserve not because of what we've done, but because of what we are, the image, the extension of God itself. So imagine now, a month from today, whether you are back here or somewhere else, on vacation, at work, in your new whatever, in your old whatever, but imagine being with somebody, a friend, a loved one, and telling them how beautifully the month unfolded without knowing any of the specifics. Tell them about a month of effortless accomplishment, of wonderful surprises, spontaneous manifestations of good. What else? See how happy they are for you. Feel how good it feels to have let it happen without struggle, without manipulation. 
have simply lined up your thoughts and feelings with that of a God that loves you beyond measure. And so we offer ourselves now to this God, this God who is not separate, not judgmental, not punitive or punishing. We offer ourselves to this divine presence now that it may awaken this great wisdom within us, joyfully using us, our hands, our feet, and our voices to channel this love and grace and peace to all those around us who are willing to receive it. We let go of the attachment to it being particular people. We are simply the relaxed vessels through which it flows. For this we are so grateful. And together we all say, amen. Thank you very much for coming. Have a wonderful month. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the book that I mentioned is available in the bookstore, Affirmations 101. It's my, it's my new book. And afterwards, if you want me to sign it, I will sign it. And I will be here next month.